Today, it's the Future Forward Sing Along Show. We'll tune into music from iTunes to Spotify to Google Music. How can an artist even survive in the streaming world? I'm Alexis Cordato. And I am Steven Rosenbaum. And let us launch. Hey, Alexa. Hey, Steve. Happy... I feel like you should have sang, uh, sang this whole intro. You know, I'm, I'm somewhat tone deaf, tune deaf, so you wouldn't really want, want me to sing. But that being said, I do like music very much. So, uh, so you know, as we've dug into spending what amounts to three, almost four chapters on the future of music, it's a complicated, complicated space. But it's exciting. It's like it's so much change and I think uh, it's about time that we actually maybe synthesized what's actually happening. All right, so so let, let's just dive right in because the iTunes story kind of got lost in all the Apple news of last week. But um, but this is officially the end of iTunes. And Wait, are we going to talk about this before skipping over whether you bought your new iPhone phone or not? Oh, you're going to... Okay, so I was trying to start with with an upbeat Apple. So I I I did. I'll get to the end of the story first, which is I did end up getting the new iPhone. Well, I've ordered the iPhone 11 Pro. But 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 the process was incredibly messy, um, and and I you know I found myself thinking, yeah, Apple may be more it may. I tried to pre pre-order it on Thursday night and they said that my they couldn't make my social security number work which the fact that I'm giving them my social security number is creepy in ways I can't even imagine. Then on then I did the the 8 a.m. Friday morning thing for half an hour and that just totally failed. Um, then I called in and got transferred to a manager who transferred me transferred me to a store who transferred me to the business office who hung up on me. I mean, accidentally, but whatever. Um, and then I finally just gave up. Oh, so compelling, like you wanted the phone, but knowing the process, you're like over it. No, then on Saturday, I went online. And as long as I was willing to wait for it to be shipped to me sometime in the middle of October, they were happy to sell it to me. Okay. So I don't know whether it's a supply chain issue or a relationship between the ba- so I have I'm on the Apple upgrade program, mm-hmm. which theoretically should have had me at the head of the line instead of the back of the line. But I just decided, look, don't get me wrong, I'm super excited about the iPhone, you know, 11 Pro. I think it actually the the photography is going to be spectacular, and I'm looking forward to that. But uh, I will not have it on the 20th of September to wave around. I I will not have geek bragging rights which i'm okay with anyway but but back to itunes yeah because that is music is the topic of this show and itunes it you know the history of itunes um which which we found in this funky but fabulous profile in europeanceo.com it's a link we'll put in the show notes um you know itunes began um in 2001 yeah the era of steve jobs peak steve so what is that it's 18 years ago yeah uh and you know the 99 cent a song thing in and of itself is is fascinating right because at that point the music industry was so getting punched in the face by theft and napster and the sense that everything was going to be a runaway train and they were just going to be screwed out of any revenue that Jobs had an enormous amount of leverage. Yeah, he was a visionary ahead of his time. And this is also at a time when the iPod and a thousand songs in your pocket was a transformative device. Yeah, right? it, yeah. just, it was amazing. Um, but but along the way, and, and by the way, I mean, we've talked about this. There was some losses, right? I mean, one of the losses was, you know, as a musician, you know, putting together an album and having it have a journey for a for a listener um, got replaced by songs, which tend to be hit driven. So it's harder and harder. No, I'm going to just keep stipping, st- putting my foot in my mouth. I was going to say it's harder and harder for for edgier music to get out there. But of course, that's not true. 
It's just different. It's just, yeah, right. I, um, so, like, for you, what was it, was iTunes your portal to something special? No, it was always just one of many choices. I mean, I think I got, I bought my first CDs at Tower Records and maybe even at the, the end of the aisles and Blockbuster. And also had LimeWire and Napster and then also had an iPod and iTunes. Like I, I think I was growing up, you know, in middle school where digital and the choice around it was obvious and apparent. So a couple of weeks ago, I went to a, a, a big art show in Brooklyn about street art. And, and there was a moment, which I'll never forget, and I wish I'd taken out my phone and recorded it, but there was a young girl, she must have been 12, and a father, and they were in this, one of the exhibits was a, 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 a record store, a rebuilt record, street record store. And he walked over to her, and they picked out a record together, vinyl, and they put it on the turntable. And I watched him show her how the needle went on the turntable. And she literally had no idea what he was doing. Yeah. Couldn't same thing under- with a cassette tape. I would imagine it would be the same with a cassette tape. Yeah, but cassette tapes have no romance. Vinyl has romance. Like I don't know about that. I, I made some fun mixtapes. Different, yeah, but... but another conversation but 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 what was interesting to me was for her music is in her phone which is in her pocket there was nothing visceral about music as opposed to a record album and taking the record out and putting it on the, I'm, okay i'm uh, I, mm-hmm. all right but, but don't, i don't i didn't mean to get into nostalgia but let's get back to itunes cuz itunes is coming to an end and it's a big deal and it's a big deal because even fans of iTunes will admit it's been a hacked together bunch of services now for a long time. Yeah, music, it's mu- music is confusing, and and they admit it. I mean, what's good about this this article is they essentially say, you know, if you talk to Apple, they're like, since we became mobile first, iTunes has been broken. Yes, it's like the obvious. You know, I mean, it, it was as someone who's fairly tech savvy the idea of how apple handles files and being able to transport files across your devices and using itunes as an interface has always been confusing yeah and and part of that is i think and it's hard to know the exact date some of our listeners might you know know better than we do but like there's a moment in time when internally apple said we don't want people uploading like when when the iPod stopped being the chief reason to be in that business for them, selling the iPod and putting your music library up in it and storing it, and instead it pivoted to, no, we want you buying things from us and listening to them and probably not downloading them, right? I mean, the whole idea that you're not really going to own these songs anymore, you're kind of going to borrow them, mm-hmm. um, is at least was for a generation that was used to ownership was pretty troubling. Probably not so much anymore. Right. Um, all right. So at the, at, at the risk of spending the entire show on iTunes, which is fascinating, but probably not pod worthy. Let, let's jump to where we are on Apple Music, because Apple Music, okay. you know, a lot of people thought Apple Music was going to fail. I did. Yeah. Ten thousand percent. I mean, I, I love Spotify. I'm like a Spotify fan girl. And. Has Apple Music done anything to get you to sample it? No. <laughs> no. I mean, the closest was maybe when Taylor Swift was uh, talking to, uh, uh, I guess, talking to them about their her concert or something like that. You were, like, uploading her next album and, and the concert on iTunes. But So... Not compelling, just interesting. Like, it was the first time that I was sort of, like, Huh, what's Apple trying to do? So I'm not sure I've ever heard of anyone describe themselves as a Spotify fangirl. So explain to me the for you where Apple Music sits and and Google Music for that matter, uh, and and where Spotify fits. So I'm 
I am highly, highly biased in the sense that I am a Spotify early adopter. When I first heard about the existence of Spotify and what it could do and how it worked, I actually downloaded a VPN so that I could download and use Spotify and pretend that I was in the UK because it was not available in the United States. And it was one of the first experiences, one of of many experiences where I just used technology for the first time and I said, oh my goodness, it works and it's magical. And and is the difference, I mean, I'm trying to understand, so I'm a Spotify kind of passive user, but like, is the difference for you, is it, is it music discovery or is it access? Does it, does it, does its algorithm do such a good job of saying to you, Hey Alexa, here's a song you you you've never heard, but it's like things you like. Does it do so that? There are a few things. So I, I, again, the bias here is that I was an early adopter. Spotify did something that Apple and Google were not, and so I've always perceived their brand and their product as being ahead of the game. Uh, the service is reliable and it's fast and it works across multiple devices and it's intuitive, and so it kind of does what you want it to do and what you expect it to do. But then it layers on top of that um, discovery. Like I do think the uh, if, uh, sort of the algorithm around things that you might like, um, the fun campaigns that they've done in terms of your data. Like, hey, here are the songs that you listened to in 2018. And here's your horoscope and songs that cancers like. They've managed to embed themselves in the hearts and minds of listeners in a way that Apple and Google have frankly failed to do. And, and we got to throw title in there, I guess. Yeah. That title has that like Jay Z street cred in it, which is cool, but it's not comprehensive enough to compete. All right. So, so you look at Apple music, 60 million subs and your reaction is they just own the device and they can kind of, I don't. Need, I assume that my memory is that there's a free sample. You get it for free for some months, and there's a some free thing. Yeah, I. I mean, I don't know. I think I've probably said this several times on this podcast that everything old is new again. And so when we think about cable television and a world where people have access to hundreds of channels, but maybe they only realistically watch five, if that. That's kind of what's happening for me with all of these streaming services, which is we have access to more content than ever, but in terms of any one channel or or provider being dominant, I just don't, I don't see it. I see Apple playing a game of catch up. I see us benefiting from the fact that we have good options. We have good streaming options, period. Right. But but what's interesting about music as opposed to video, for example, is Apple Music, Google, Spotify, essentially all have access to the same raw material. So it comes down to the UI and who does a better job of surfacing things. And, and to your point, it was interesting when you talked about liking Spotify's kind of engagement with the music and how they share it with you. I mean, it's as much the brand energy that you connect with because, you know, if you're listening to XYZ band, you can find it anywhere. Oh yeah. And also as someone who follows tech and startup culture, the fact that Spotify is not an American company is also amazing. And if you look at their corporate benefits, they definitely are a Swedish company. Daniel Eck is cool. Um, that, you know, it's funny. And um, so there's an article in the verge that, that, The headline caught my eye. It says streaming now makes up 80% of the music industry's revenue, which immediately made me think, what's the other 20%? Like hats and t-shirts? No. Like what? What? Where? I assume yes. Like the the concerts and and if you look at artists now and what they do to market themselves, they have to market themselves as brands, not just musicians. But what's complicated, you know, and, you know, 
it, it, it's it's hard to say that this is well is it a great time for music good bad it's it's different and i think are you familiar with what happened with uh little nas x and old town road i'm gonna say no okay the really quick version is that you had a digital native a millennial whatever you want to call it someone who's like 20 years old um, who understood how to make things viral on the internet. And this is a person who spliced and diced uh, memes on Twitter and used uh, TikTok to actually drive up uh, the consumption of his song, Old Town Road. And it debuted in number one on the US Top 100. That is fascinating to me. It's a great case study in terms of this new class of entertainers, musicians, and content creator, digital content creators. Someone who understands their product and what they make and they record and is also masterful with regards to the distribution of that and audience development. Which, which strangely enough, made me think immediately of a link that we had further down in the rundown, but I'm going to pull it up because I think it ties to the, well, you, the story you just told, which is this headline that says, YouTube music cracks down on rampant chart manipulation with new pay-for-play ban. Yes. So, so it's incredibly hard to develop an audience organically on YouTube. If you have a branded YouTube channel, it is hard to get subscribers and... Uh, you know, this is my biggest gripe with you with uh, the Google ecosystem, which is everything that they do is incentivized to help drive up the monetization of their ads product. And so for them to be cracking down on uh, pay for play on YouTube is is really interesting because they're actually limiting uh, this idea that in order to grow an audience that you need to spend your way there. So when I wrote my last book, there's a whole thing in the publishing world with book authors who get pre-book speaking engagements around their book and get the speaking engagements to pre-buy big chunks of their book. And it's all meant to game the New York Times bestseller list. Yep. And it's all you want. You want the buys to land at a certain time and you want them to land in. They have to come from different buyers. So it doesn't all look like a bulk buy. Like there's a whole strategy around how to essentially have your book land on the bestseller list by having lots of copies non organically get purchased on on the day they go on sale. And this seems to me like that. And and by the way, the Times and a bunch of other people fight back against that mightily. But this seems to me like a similar thing. And I guess, so So if you have a new song coming out, the way that you could get it to be in the top of the chart is essentially to buy, buy what? Buy paid views. Buy, buy ads against it to help distribute it and effectively put sponsorship dollars behind content. Okay, tell me why that's bad. Well, because it means that the artists who have the money to do that, the likes of Taylor Swift, have a greater chance of having hits than up and coming indie musicians or uh, musicians who haven't been discovered. It's like a, a small business owner competing with your Whole Foods or Rite Aid down the block. All right, I'm 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 reading this TechCrunch article because it's clear it it's explaining. I mean, I'll just read it. Uh, in, um, quotes. Um, one report by Rolling Stone detailed how the practice worked with regarding YouTube TrueView ads. This form of advertising lets advertisers, like an artist or label, play a shortened version of a music video as an advertisement in front of other videos. Under some conditions, like if a YouTube user interacts with the video or watches it for a certain amount of time it would count as a video view overall. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's garbage. That's total that's garbage. garbage. Yeah, that's total garbage. It's payola. It's like the new form of payola. I wonder what the I wonder I wonder what the meeting was like where YouTube said we're going to walk away from 
you know, this many zeros in order to in order to get our charts to not be looked at as garbage. Hmm. Um, interesting. Uh, all right. So 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 let let let's let's pivot a little bit and, and talk about making music. Um, yep. So so Spotify acquired Sound Better, a music production marketplace, which I thought was fascinating, because to me that's a internally that's a big shift for them to go from being the stage in which music is performed on to being the makers of music or the tool makers of music. But I think that's the that's a that's inevitable in the sense that if any of these platforms are going to be a true marketplace, then they can't think of themselves as delivering the product, delivering the music. They also have to control the source. And so if you look at the content wars, whether it's video or music, you have sort of this land grab or like gold rush moment where every major uh, media company is trying to create more content, more media. And so Spotify's entire roadmap is in service of not just the listener, but also the creator. And so we see this with the acquisition of Sound Better, um, but we also saw this with the acquisition of Gimlet earlier in the year, which is uh, which is their podcast company. Yeah, let, let, let's save that, that acquisition for another day because I, I have some fairly strong feelings about that that aren't directly related to music. But but let's so so I I think though the the Spotify play here is really I mean if you, if you if you assume they have a ten year roadmap right whether they're going to stay on it or not they've said here's where we are today and here and in ten years or five or three but not twenty. What they're really saying is, we want to disintermediate the labels from our business. Yes, we want to be, uh, we do not want to be dependent on the labels. Right. Yeah. We want artists to use our tools, make music, put it on Spotify, deliver it to audiences, get paid fairly, and for the labels to, essentially, they can improve how much artists get if they're not having to pay the VIG that the labels charge, which is tremendous yep so it's an artist friendly move but a label it's it's and and i assume that, that there have been other i mean i haven't been following spotify although i will after this but it seems to me there probably you know are lots of examples of spotify being at you know at war with labels one way or another all right but i mean we're again when i reference Little Nas and Old Town Road. I mean, a few years ago, we had the emergence of Chance the Rapper from Chicago who didn't sign with a major record label. And his, you know, uh, and he he basically uh, was able to kind of do it on his own. Uh, so I think we're, we're just going to see more of that. This is like the tip of the iceberg. Um so there's a there's an IEEE article that I pulled up um, that that I think probably plays into this pretty well. Um, um, well, there's a couple actually, but um, they they did this fabulous profile of Joe Prima, uh, who added a whole Tesla coil lightning bolt performance strategy to his stage performance. Um, partly high tech, partly a little goofy. But, you know, it plays into this idea that in order for artists to be selling tickets in arenas and in big venues, they need to put on a show that is both musical and theatrical in a way that maybe it's never been before. Yeah. So this I mean, this speaks to this idea that whether it's better or worse is a taste thing, but it's different. And the bar, the bar, I think, is frankly higher. It's higher because the the name of the game is to be different. Do you do have you do you do big shows? Do you are you like a stadium show girl? Um, no. I mean, I want to say like the last big stadium show I did was maybe John Mayer at the O2 Arena in London, but 
that's just because he was like touring again with his trio, which is not a big stadium act. <laughs> Interesting. I saw The Cure at Radio City Music. No, 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 at um, uh, uh, Madison Square Garden. Um, and it, I mean, it was it was fun to be with you know that many people and listen to that music. But it was definitely uh, a different experience. I mean, I'm used to the Beacon Theater kind of smaller venue stuff. Mm-hmm. No, and I go to shows in Brooklyn, like um, Brooklyn Steel is amazing. I saw Phoenix there last year, and uh, I'm an equal opportunity audience member. I'll go big, I'll go small. It depends I've, ne- on I've you. never done Brooklyn Steel, but I always I always look at the shows and think I should go, and then other things catch my, my eye. Um, so, so maybe the last chapter here um, is, you know, there, there definitely are battles over revenue that, you know, um, so there's a couple, there's a terrific Pitchfork article about how artists, imposters and fake songs sneak into streaming services. Um, I didn't know that that was a thing. People essentially, Neither did I. I had yeah. no idea. Um, but, but it makes perfect sense, right? I mean, you know, if you can make something sound enough like something that I'm going to wander into it and you're signed up to be getting the revenues from that, you know, I mean, part of what's changed is in these enormous ecosystems, there aren't individuals pushing buttons, there are algorithms. So if you upload a song that sounds like a famous artist, then it becomes, quote, popular or listened to, which I guess means popular, you know, you're going to get a fire hose of money before somebody, you know, you know, hollers foul ball. Yeah. Um, does that ever change? Is it, you know? You mean, can we ever prevent that yeah. from happening? Oh, I don't know, because everything moves so quickly. I mean, it's it's like saying, can we ever prevent, you know, bad live streams of terrible, tragic events? Can we ever prevent fake news from being spread within a matter of minutes and hours. I, I actually don't know. All right, so so, la- so last money battle, but one that I think is really interesting, is music publishers going after the Peloton bicycle. Um, yeah, this is funny. I mean, for me as a marketer, it's like, you know, you're always trying to identify a, a target audience or a market to go after. And I chuckled when I saw this. <laughs> you know, because to be fair, I think the question is, at what point is uh, is music being promoted on a new platform promotion, and at what point is it theft? And music publishers are saying $300 million, so they clearly think it's theft. They think it's theft because they feel like money is being taken away from them, but in a different context, it's distribution and audience development. And if they felt like they couldn't win over that Peloton user on their own, then it would be a strategic partnership. And there would be a way to exchange money where both sides would profit. So if you were, I I guess I'm thinking about it. So if you you were inside Peloton and, and you knew you were programming copyrighted music as a, as a fairly significant piece of the experience, would you not want to license it or would you just say, we'll wait till they come calling and we'll make a settlement? Like one of those uh, beg for forgiveness before yeah. ask for permission scenarios. Yeah. I mean, you know, the music industry is going to start at 300 million. Peloton is going to offer 10 million. They're going to argue in court for two years. The lawyers are going to get paid a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, it's I, I can see how both sides of the argument would would make uh, would make a case, but think about the absurdity of Spotify going against bars that are streaming playlists from a paid Spotify subscription. Um, is that a, a made up story or a real story? No, I'm just saying it's like I, if you go into any bar or restaurant, there's a there's a percentage of the music you're hearing that's coming from a Spotify playlist that is paid for because there are no commercials running on it and it's it and in that case it's it's distribution and it is the owner of that account 
using it. And in Peloton's case, it's like, okay, they're programming music and they're, they're using it however they want. It's just easier to track and there's like a finite quantity and value being assigned to that experience. So, so if I called Spotify and said, hi, I own a bar on the Upper West Side and I'd like to play Spotify, is there a commercial account I can set up? They would say, what? Why? Like, right. That's what just they, yeah, go yeah. run like run like the wind. I wonder if that'll change someday. Interesting. All right. Well, so we are out of time. This has been really fun. We we did a whole show talking about music without playing any music, which is probably, you know, we probably get a B minus for production value for not playing some songs. But uh, me, you know what? We'll we'll put up a couple of in the in the show notes. We'll put up a couple of links to. Uh, some of Alexa's songs she's listening to right now, and a couple of mine. So you could, uh, there will be a, we'll, we'll, we'll have some links of, of how different our music libraries are. Okay. All right. Sounds like a plan. We are out of time. See you See next, you next week. week.